Hello, and welcome to the Aspen Ideas Festival. We're having a conversation today on climate change and how we can uh, really think about it in a healthy way. Uh, we're going to have some interaction with you guys first to kick us off instead of uh, towards the end. Um, and I don't know if, uh, about you, but if you got a chance to see the panel, the thing that caught my eye immediately, Alina, your TikToks are amazing. But I will say, when I saw climate anxiety psychologist, which is in your bio, uh, Thomas, I was like, wait, that's a thing? And I'm not sure if any of you also saw that and thought, wait, maybe we could get some group therapy here. And you're at this session because you'd like some group therapy. You're in luck, because I, I feel the same way. And that's what we're going to try to get out of it. So at the end of this panel, we're hoping that you can leave feeling a little bit more stable about uh, the way you see the world and the crisis that we are facing today. So we're going to play a very fun game. This game, I just made it up. It's called Doom Scrolling in Real Life. So how, how many of you have doom scrolled on Twitter, TikTok, Facebook, anything like that? OK, all of us. So you know how this game works. Uh, the difference is we're going to stand up and we're going to do it. So we're going to need some volunteers. You're going to have 10 seconds, 15 seconds. We only need like four or five because we don't want to get too far down the rabbit hole. But what I'm hoping you can do is I'm hoping you can stand up and you can say a headline or you can tell us a climate change or an ecological disaster story uh, that, that you have in your mind or that you've recently seen. And we're going to recreate the irresponsible algorithms that we see all around us right here. And then we're going to kind of deal with it on a person to person basis, which is what we probably should all do anyway. Mm -hmm. So I, I'll start just to kind of break the ice here. Um, OK, so recently I covered the, uh, fl the plight of the Vaquita Marina down in the Sea of Cortez. It's the world's smallest porpoise. There's only possibly 10 of them left. They are on the brink of the extinction, and they may go extinct within the next uh, two years. And right now, not enough is being done. Not enough people care about it. it stresses me out. OK, there's my 10, 15 seconds, right? You saw my TikTok. Who's next? All right, we got a, we got a, a volunteer <laughs> over here. but uh, we're going to run out of water in 30 years. 30 years, right, yeah. Anybody else see any headlines similar to that? Just looking around these mountains and seeing all the dead uh, pine trees from bark beetle. Bark beetle and the fires, we've got fires, we've got Yellowstone. Anybody else have a, a quick little doom scroll that we, that we see? Ha ha. Um, if we don't do anything in the next 30 years, um, we're, we're not gonna be able to fix it because it's already too late. We're gonna live Perfect, and then the clouds part. And we have, let's just pretend like you guys are all on TikTok, right? We all just saw these. We're very feeling very depressed. Dun, 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 dun. And TikTok, you have bad cell phone service. Interest. A new train in the UK runs on biofuel made from art poop, <laughs> food waste, animal manure, and crop. Can we restart it? The world's first solar powered motorhome can travel up to 450 miles on a sunny day without charging. OK, so we're going to restart it here. Here's some good climate news that you might have missed. A new train in the UK runs on biofuel made from art poop, food waste, animal manure, and crop residues. The world's first solar-powered motorhome can travel up to 450 miles on a sunny day without charging. A recent study has shown that covering California's canals with solar panels would save the state 63 billion gallons of water from evaporating annually and help the state produce more renewable energy. Heinz has produced the world's first 100% recyclable ketchup bottle and it's made out of paper. Researchers have found a way to 3D print coral skeletons using terracotta and they hope the breakthrough will help restore coral reefs. A recent study has shown a 35% decrease in carbon emissions in the U.S. diet over the last 15 years due to people making choices to eat less animal products. And researchers have found an easier and cheaper way to remove arsenic from water using wood chips, leaf mulch, iron filings, and limestone. As always, if you need more climate optimism, go follow Peak Action. Climate optimism, and that is Elena Woods, ladies and gentlemen. Now, the reason why I show you that is that is such a breath of fresh air. That was uh, seven, eight, nine stories back to back that give you some optimism, and they are so uh, different than everything else that we normally see. So, uh, as somebody that, that part of my job description is literally doom scrolling. I see that, I wanna know everything about everything you just talked about, but I also wanna know, how did you get into the headspace where you could think positively about 
climate change and the crisis that we're in? It's a good question. So I myself suffer from climate anxiety. I'm pretty sure that's the reason I'm a scientist and science communicator today. I felt like I needed to do something to enact climate action and being a scientist was a great way to do it and now being a science communicator is an even better way to do it. But when I became a science communicator, which was back at the beginning of the pandemic, I downloaded TikTok like I think so many people maybe in this room did and quickly discovered people were freaking out about climate change online, but there was no one trying to stop them from freaking out. Yes, fear is good. We should be scared. Climate change is really scary, but we shouldn't let that fear paralyze us into not doing things. So I decided, well, I don't hear anything about solutions, and I'm a scientist, and I think that's really sad. We have the solutions. They're there. No one's talking about it. So I decided to make the switch to address my own climate anxiety to start researching solutions and share them with the public because I was seeing so many young people freaking out about it online. TikTok is great for sharing your feelings, getting into an algorithm where you see things that you like, but again, that can lead down that doom scrolling path. And I saw the opportunity to help those people. And again, it helped me and it helped the public discover, yes, there is hope. We can fix this, we've got the solutions, and if we're in a better headspace, we're more likely to take action. Now, Thomas, as a psychologist, hearing this, what's happening psychologically speaking? What, what did she do, and is that something that everybody at home can also replicate? I think we can in our own ways. Um, one, one of the big ideas I wanna get out today is that Successful, a successful coping experience regarding climate change is, is not is separate than solving climate change. Climate change is a big, multi-tentacled problem. All the different um, talks that we have here on social justice, on democracy, on technology, that's all part of climate change. Um, but the coping is something we can learn, we can get better at. It doesn't mean that, and it's a curve, it's a, it's a learning curve, and sometimes we're gonna be on top of the curve and feeling good and feeling inspired. I mean, many of you are feeling inspired about things you're hearing at this conference, um, and there are gonna be some down times as well. One of the biggest dangers is being alone in the process, because when we're alone, there's no one to help us in the down cycle. When we're with a bunch of people, usually we might be able to help someone that's a little below us, a little lower than us, or certainly be inspired by someone above. So that's where I would start, yeah. And, and there's, a, there's also this sense, you know, even as we talked before the panel, it's a difficult topic because the crisis is so pressing for those that are paying attention, and yet there's almost like a guilt associated with the idea that, okay, well, I'm gonna allow myself to be happy, and yet this is something that is affecting so many people across the world, many communities much more severely than others, and how do you do both of those things? How can you be optimistic? How can you be happy when, when we're seeing suffering, when we're seeing you know, fires raging, and, and when we're seeing a drought that is uh, literally drying the soil that feeds the country? Is that guilt healthy? Guilt is a healthy emotion. Fear is a healthy emotion, anxiety is a healthy emotion. Evolution has given us all these emotions and they serve us, they serve us well. Um, uh, one of the images I use with emotions is a, is a compass. So if I have an old fashioned compass, the needle will, as I move around, the needle is gonna point in, in toward trying to find north. And so we should be able to feel all of our emotions, 360 emotions, right? That, that at some points might include guilt, but it also, it includes appreciation of beauty, it includes inspiration, it includes mindfulness, it includes being present. So I, th I think the key in coping is, is making sure that we don't get stuck on certain feelings, but really growing all the feelings, which is a process and it takes practice. Now for you, Lena, I mean, you're on TikTok, so a lot of, you're creating content, but you're also consuming content and you're probably reading a lot of the comments. There's good, there's bad, there's ugly. Uh, but what are the things that inspire you to post positive comments and what are the things that, uh, that you see as just huge roadblocks when it comes to unifying people and trying to get everybody to stand on common ground? 
So the whole reason I made the switch from really just discussing climate issues to discussing climate issues and solutions was seeing the comments from people saying, I was having a panic attack. You helped me stop having that panic attack. You've helped me realize there is hope and I'm, I'm an activist again. I'm planning for my future again. There's so many young people who have told me I wasn't planning on starting a family, having a career. I just thought I was going to die in the next five, 10 years because of climate change. So those comments inspire me to keep going because yes, it helps me, but I'm helping so many other people take that first step to addressing their climate anxiety. And one of the biggest roadblocks I see in my comment sections are people saying, well, I, you know, the science may say it's not too late to address climate change, but I still believe it is. Politically, it might be governments, corporations, you name it. They still are in this negative, cynical mindset. And with the algorithm, when you get a lot of cynical comments, it gets pushed onto the for you pages, the algorithms of those who share those feelings. Mm -hmm. And that can scare people, the people who want to change, the people who may not truly believe it's hopeless, because if they see the comment sections full of doom, they're gonna think it's true. So there's climate deniers, and then there's those that say, ah, it's too late. Absolutely. And does that, does that lead to, like that cynicism, does that lead to, to apathy? Does, and can you come back from that? I don't know if I would call it apathy so much as paralyzing fear. And I am seeing people coming back from it once they've put a name to what they're feeling, which is climate anxiety, taking the time to learn about solutions and to really cherry pick where they're getting their news from. If they're realizing, oh, if I'm getting my news from places that just discuss the issues, that might be freaking me out. Maybe I should change up who I'm following, who I'm reading from, things like that. Well, it's funny because during the pandemic, I, I don't know if you guys saw, it's Bo Burham, right? Do you guys know who Bo Burham is? He's this uh, genius that was locked up for way too long <laughs> by himself. And he did some incredible things. And his production that he pulled off by himself is something that should be applauded. However, when you're stuck inside in a pandemic for a, a long time and, and you're writing songs, one of the songs that he wrote that spread like wildfire was about how like we're all totally screwed. And I saw a TikTok that you did where you talked about the dangers of not just that song going out, that song going viral, but then people using that same music to make their own take on how doomed we are. Can we, take, can we play that one? Now. I enjoy fatalistic humor just as much as the next guy. But when that fatalistic humor crosses the line into misinformation, it no longer becomes funny to me. And that really well done cover is actually climate doom, which is a form of misinformation that insinuates it is too late to solve the climate crisis. And I understand, climate change is absolutely terrifying and it can feel like it's too late, but it's not. And spreading climate doom is actually pretty harmful, even though the people I see on this app who spread it are always well-intentioned. So climate change is already causing mental health issues in people. Over half of young people experience eco-anxiety to some extent. And climate doom is increasing those mental health issues, often to the point where people are having mental breakdowns, panic attacks, or being institutionalized, which is already bad enough, but then climate doom also leads to climate inaction. But people are giving up on climate activism, which ultimately hurts the climate movement, AKA hurts our chances of actually solving it. So moral of the story, you can talk about how scary climate change is without spreading climate doom. So interestingly enough, uh, you talk about the fatalism. We all have uh, senses of humor that sometimes are more dark than others. And uh, usually that's done in, in a place where you and I are having a conversation and we're like, well, we're, you know, uh, these forests may not be here in 20 years. And then you kind of move on and you know that you're not taking it seriously or, or the other person's like, well, you know, we could probably do something. But that face-to-face -face conversation passes and this communication between people passes. The difference between that is when a song like that starts trending and then somebody searches or somebody gets that song trending on their TikTok page, all of a sudden they are seeing that over and over and over and over again. And so my question for the psychologist is, are we wired to see that type of fatalism? And if that's what we're exposed to constantly, what are, what are the results? 
You know, as a psychologist, I, there's a couple of uh, data points that are in my mind. 43% um, of people on the planet are younger than age 25. Right? So um, for those people, climate change has always been there. They have, they've grown up with climate change. So um, we have to understand that. And um, so it's, it's, it occupies a large chunk, if not the entire chunk of their development and really crucial parts of their development. And also uh, around 3% of the news we see is focused on climate solutions. About 3%? 3%. There's a, there's a new field called solutions journalism. Thanks to Atlanta. To, it would yes, have been like 1% now. trying to work on this. <laughs> so we also have, um, we have a situation where we're swimming in the sea of 97%. And that's just the discourse that we have in science and media is about looking at the problems first. And then we don't spend as, that much time talking about the problems. So yes, we are wired to look for threats. I mean, that's how humans have survived. So we do tend to see threats in the environment and disregard positive thing. So that's, that is a natural tendency. But when you take that natural tendency, I think it's actually the, the issue is, is the information. So even in the last, I'm always learning. And even in the last few days, as I've been thinking about this, you know, it, the hopelessness is really in some ways a perceptual problem. There are things happening all around the world. There's millions of environmental, environmental groups. There's tons of solutions happening. But we, are, we have a hope blind spot. That's something to think about. And so part of the process when I'm working with a client is, you know, I say validate, elevate, create. So we take this as an issue, um, let's, let's validate it, it's real, let's elevate it. That's what we're doing today. We're putting this on the pedestal. And then let's get creative about it. And that creativity could be educating ourselves. It could, it could be um, celebrating victories. I um, mean, it, it could be um, meditating on things that we can't quite control. Sometimes it's nauseating because we, we can't take it, you know. But again, we're creating a structure where we can start to cope with this. And it's a coping muscle that we can build. So uh, your work is fascinating. And not only are you, are you working with individuals that are suffering from climate anxiety, you're also training other psychologists and other yeah. care providers on how to, to treat people as well, right? Yeah. What is, uh, you know, for... Uh, for all of us that probably have a sense of climate anxiety, uh, what does that look like? What would a therapy session look like? Would it, do you talk about your client? I mean, it's, it sounds kind of um, uh, traditional, but do you sit down on a couch and talk about your climate feelings? That's part of it. I mean, I draw from two, two strands. One is clinical psychology, which is a, a long tradition of, 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 of therapeutic skills and all kinds of things we can access. And then environmental psychology, which is much much younger field, which is understanding people's connections with nature, their environmental values, how, how, it, how their, their environmental identity, our sense of our, our identity in relation to nature and the natural world and how that evolves over our lifespan. And so... My work is bringing those two strands together in the meeting and in, in the session, and that's what I'm trying to help the therapist to. So it is doing the coping, what are you feeling, how can you put language to your feelings, how can you reclaim your nervous system, which means pulling off of the media, getting outside, doing stress reduction, all these kinds of things. But then the, the underneath that is building this environmental identity, re recovering our sense of our values and our self. Because that's ultimately the strength. People have trouble coping because they get all this information, but they don't really have, they don't have a core, you know, of, of the, you know, we do have connections with nature, but we haven't been taught to talk about them, to articulate them. So we need to, you know, I was talking to someone yesterday who was actually speaking now on, on Ukraine, and she's here, and her, her, her children are in England, and her husband's in Ukraine, but she had this incredible belief in what they were doing. And when you have that belief, that she knew what she was fighting for, what they were fighting for. And so part of this process is, is the coping, but it's also building that core. So what does that look like from a practical standpoint? Let's break that down just a little bit more. Mm -hmm. Environmental identity. Yes. Uh, is it something that, that you sit down and reflect on? Is it something that's constantly... Like, let me just ask you, what's your environmental identity? Yeah, your environmental identity, my environmental identity is my sense of self in relation to nature and the natural world. And it's, it's, it's um, like all of our identities. We have a gender identity, cultural identity, sexual identity. All of you can articulate things about this. But there was a point when you had to be given language for that. 
you might not have known how to do that. And so part of our process is saying, what is my environmental identity? How do I talk about that? And how does it intersect with my gender identity, my cultural identity, and things like that? A good place to start with the environmental identity, or where I would start, was, was at, the, at the timeline of my life. What, where, where was I born? I was born in western New York State, in Buffalo, New York, kind of a working class town. Wasn't, wasn't an ideal nature place, you know? And then my, what, what were my parents like? What were our values? What was our socioeconomic class? Did I have pets? Did I do outdoor activities? What did I learn in school? And we, can, we, we all have an environmental timeline, all of you. And it has your education, your mentoring, books, movies, experiences, travel, losses. And I could, we could do it right now. We could, I could give you paper and you could draw it out. It's all here. But again, how many, raise your hand if you've ever been taught, ever been asked what your environmental identity is, right? It, it's, but you could talk about it. So that's, that's part of the process. So, it, so it's, it's not that mysterious, actually. It's right here. It's right in the room. I'm hoping you guys can think about this after the panel and we can mm -hmm. possibly talk about this further. But I'd love to you know, put you on the spot, too. What would you say your environmental identity is? So I grew up and still live in the Appalachian Mountains in Tennessee. And those mountains are a huge part of my life. I wake up in the morning, I see them. I hike there. I pick up litter there. I just want to protect them. And that's why I'm a scientist, in fact. So being in the mountains around nature, I mean, I have a <laughs> tattoo of a fern you can see there. <laughs> It, it is me. I love being outside. I hike, I mountain bike, I camp, I raft. It's, it is me. I feel like I may have more of an environmental outdoor identity than others, but everyone has one. As we talk about it, mine, I mean, you're talking about where you're from, and immediately, even before we delved into it, mine is, I was born in Guatemala, mm -hmm. so the verdant green there, and mm -hmm. grew up in New Mexico, and so the desert, and both mm -hmm. of those are you know, I think that that love of, of those ecosystems is my identity. But then I, I think to uh, the people that may not experience the great outdoors or may not have a relationship with nature, may be living in, uh, you know, an urban environment uh, or, or, or may be uh, in dire poverty and have never left the four mile radius of where they live. How does, how does a person like that form an, an identity, uh, and how does a person like that not feel uh, overwhelmed by this sense that things are changing beyond their control, and like uh, their fight or flight is, is almost engaged uh, from the get-go whenever they see one of these headlines? Mm -hmm. Is it, do you see in some of your patients, people that come from marginalized communities or, or places where they don't have the resources or they just don't have a, a a well-formed uh, connection to, to Mother Nature as we see it here in Aspen in our place of privilege, um, and yet are filled with dread that they are living this hellscape that's already happening in a lot of these communities. How do you, how do you reach somebody like that? Yeah, I mean, there's a shadow side to all this work, and all environmental issues are social justice issues. So that's, that's part of our capacity building when we get into this. It's not pretty, some of this stuff. I mean, ignorance is bliss, right? And so. You know, the, uh, what is the quote from, uh, you know, the you know, uh, pains of an environmental education is living in a world of wounds, right, Aldo Leopold, mm -hmm. right? So, yeah, part of our capacity building is to realize that we have to confront injustice, we have to confront uh, environmental uh, degradation. But, you know, children aren't saddled with this negative stuff. You know, young children around the world are born into the world. And so, um, we, you know, part of one, one mission among many missions here is to work on access to green spaces and nature. And with climate change and with heat and the urban heat island effect and things like that, um, that's, a, that's an important mission, just, just bringing trees, tree canopy into, into cities and things like that. So, you know, what I would say is, you know, yes, there's problems, but then there's a lot of work to do, a lot of important things that we can do. It, it seems as though you were just talking about the differences in ages, and I know that there's probably some generational differences in how people perceive the, the crisis. Um, but it seems as though we've got generations that only know climate crisis. Like we've got a, a, a very articulate generation that cares deeply about this issue and may not be as connected to the natural world as, as people in the past. Uh, 
when you're talking to therapists and when you're doing your therapy, are there different approaches for younger people and what they're experiencing and, and some of the older people that may have been doing this for quite some time and are you know, possibly frustrated that they're not getting as far along as they'd like? There is. I mean, there's a whole developmental spectrum, just as in any kind of therapy, right? Um, young people are, um, the gift that they have is they, the, the world is new to them, so they're not jaded like old people are, right? I mean, they are coming into, they see the world. You can imagine yourself as a child that the world was new to you. Um, but young children can be very concrete in their thinking, very egocentric, and so they, they do blame themselves for things. So that's, that's a real big tragedy of some of this uh, hmm. uh, personal responsibility myth that climate change is a personal responsibility, not a, not a structural problem that, 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 affect, that impacts children. Um, but children also inspire their parents. They also <laughs> learn and grow, right? And uh, p parents are inspired by having children, mm -hmm. right? So it's, it's, it's both and. Adolescents can be qu quite idealistic, um, but then they're, they're, they're only, they haven't gone through the curve yet. So they're, they're heading for a downward spiral as they get older. Um, and then young adults are dealing with so much identity. It's not just their environmental identity. The identity is so fluid in so many ways right now. And then you've got parents or would-be parents, and you've got professionals who are trying to, like yourselves, well, professionals. It's about work-life balance. It's about how often have you actually got into nature yourself and done the restorative things that you know you need, right, while you're working. And then for elders, particularly elders that have been working in environmental issues for you know, longer than I've been alive, the, the danger is, is uh, despair, like we blew it. You know? And so every age has a risk, but also a gift. And of course, elders have all this experience. You know? And so, um, so it's, 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 it's both and. So it's, it's, it's helpful to have some roadmaps mm -hmm. with this work. Once you have some roadmaps, then you can dialogue and talk. Is there a common road in those roadmaps for everyone from climate deniers to the, the, the people that are in almost a panic to the people that are feeling like they have been trying for the longest time and it hasn't moved the needle? Is there, is there anything common between all of those that, uh, that can help people feel like, hey, we're moving forward? Yeah, I mean, we talked uh, with, with Elena last night about this. I mean, there's, a, there's kind of a pathway here. We all, there's three basic values that launch people toward environmental acts. Um, egocentric values for my own, my own self or my own family. Altruistic values, because I'm concerned with, about others. Or earth-based values, I'm concerned about natural systems. Those are the three basic uh, starter values. Uh, and then you have to have some education and have some knowledge of the world. And if you do learn about environmental issues, you, you, can, you can get a sense of how the world is. And then if there's a threat to you in some way, a threat to you or something you value, and magic ingredient, you feel some sense of efficacy that you can make a difference in some way, then you will naturally be motivated to take action. You're going to have a natural. It's going to come right out of you. It's this motivation. But that's, those are steps. Like Elena, you described it, and you've described it in your work. Um, and the difference between a denier and uh, an activist might be that they have these values, but the denier has a different set of information about the world, right? Or a different, they don't feel a threat to themselves. And the difference between, a, a, you know, someone like Elena who's really making a difference and someone who's still on the sidelines not sure is because they haven't found that efficacy yet. Mm -hmm. They haven't found their mission. They don't know what to do. So that's, that's the toughest place to be, I think, where you have the values, you have this, the alarm, you have the threat. That's the climate hostage scenario that I've talked about. I don't know what to do. You know, so ultimately, it's about us being our best self. All the therapy is about finding your unique path, your unique context. It might be just simply bearing witness. It might be taking care of your children. It might be make, surviving. But you also might be able to take action on all these problems, too. Now, Alina, there was one thing that you said that I want to circle back to, uh, and it's something that you know, I've heard a lot. I've seen people scoff at and say, that's not really happening in real life. And I know you've got a podcast about this, and that is this thought and this feeling that a lot of Gen Z and, and millennials have where it's like, I don't want to have kids because our world is too screwed up, and I'm, I'm really contemplating not having kids because I don't know where we're headed. Uh, 
Tell me a little bit about those comments, and, and is that something that seems to be growing? So it is absolutely something that seems to be growing, especially in the last year when we've been seeing more and more climate disasters hit, unfortunately, more and more of the areas near us. The climate disasters have been happening for decades, just not in our communities. When people come to me and they say, should I have kids? Or I have one kid, should I have another? Is, is this even ethical? Does it, will my child die is kind of what it boils down to. Is my child, my grandchild gonna have a horrible life? And to that I answer that it's a very personal decision for you, but there's nothing out there that says you can't have children. And in fact, if you wanna have children, have them and use them as motivation to fight for climate action hmm. because it's not so much about us fixing things now. When we enact climate action, it's not going to be an immediate fix. It's going to be 10, 20, 30 years down the line. We're doing this for the children, for the grandchildren, for ecosystems down the line, you name it. And it's a very real thing. People freaking out, worrying about having kids. And then there are these extremists, I would say, within the movement that shame people for having children, which just adds to that guilt that we often have when it comes to climate change. Mm. And I don't think that's appropriate. That's a very personal decision. And if you don't want to have children because of climate change or whatever reason, that's completely fine. But so is having children. I think they can be wonderful. And they are our future. And we need a future. As a, as a new parent, my, I have a one-year-old. And the biggest source of anxiety for me when it comes to the climate is every time she she drinks a lot she loves water and every time i fill up her little sippy cup and i give it to her i've, I've been covering what's going on with lake mead and i know that what's happening there is unprecedented and it terrifies me and i know that there are millions and millions and millions of people downstream and you can see that not enough is being done and then you look down the road five years, 10 years with the mega drought that we're experiencing and, then, and, it, and it becomes paralyzing. It, become, it goes into the, the, you know, the whole equation of like, well, do we have another kid? And when you're a parent or if you're thinking about having a family, um, and do you see people struggling with this in therapy? And, and what do you tell them uh, to help them get past some of that paralysis? Yeah, it's an important it's an important question. Like Alina said, it's it's a personal choice. But I mean, there's a number of ways to approach this. Um, one of the exercises I've done with with groups and with students is I called it the eco time machine exercise. I mean, put a chair up in front of the room, and I'd say, you can get in this chair, and I can go to any time in history you pick, and tell me what the problems are there. Tell me what the issues are. Go to go to other times in history and tell me if you want to have a child or not, <laughs> right? And so we start to realize, oh, this is a universal, this is, this is a universal question. There's been many times in history where people, for legitimate reasons, um, you know, had questions about having a child. Um, so some of it is existential. Some of it is educational. I mean, and I've even learned at, through this work, I mean, the, um, the birth rate in the United States has gone down mm -hmm. over the last few decades, but emissions have gone up. So there isn't even a clear, there isn't even a clear <laughs> right. relationship between birth and emission. So we, once you start to educate yourself, you realize, oh, okay, it's not as, it's not as simple as I thought. Um, so ultimately, the, what I've heard from experts in this area is that it's the question is not so much should I have children, it's what does it mean to be a good parent and how to have children well and what would that look like. And that's the, more, that's the more actionable question, because if I can figure out a way to do that, then, of course, I'm going to feel more. It's just like I said earlier with that efficacy. If you build a sense of efficacy, then you might make a choice one way or the other. So it's, it's not so much if, it's how. Mm -hmm. that's, 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 simply, that's simply one way of thinking. About and it. in your interaction with, uh, with people that, that come to you for advice or, or for, for help, uh, do you see uh, a lot of it coming from the children up and spreading through the family, good or bad, the anxiety from a child and this sense of impending doom that they've been fed somewhere, uh, spreading up through the family, or, or even, uh, you know, like the being eco-conscious coming and spreading through the family from children? 
Yeah, it, it, it depends. I mean, once you know about environmental identity, then you can do a, a, an environmental identity family tree. And you can take your identity and put it in a family tree. And what is the identity of my siblings or my parents or my grandparents? For some people, some of you in this room have parents or grandparents that were environmentally minded and had taught you environmental values. So that might have come down from the generations. In other families, it might come from the student in kindergarten that wants to get the family to do recycling and things like so. It depends. But we, have, we all have an environmental identity. They're all varied. It's all diverse. Um, and we all have an environmental family tree as well. We can't choose our family, right? So, um, and so all those, you know, you can plot your environmental self through through your family. So that's 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 one way of thinking about it. And we each we each have a story, and you know, owning that story it starts to give us this language to saying, well, no, I, I have something to say. I have something to do. Now, Elena, do you see that in the comment section? Absolutely. I so I will get emails from parents often saying, my kid watched your TikTok videos <laughs> and has suddenly decided that we have to be sustainable. <laughs> <laughs> Almost like, thanks, now I have more work to do. Right. <laughs> but then a lot of times in those emails, they'll be like, I didn't realize how bad the problem was and how much it was impacting my child to the point where they're very nervous, they're freaking out, they might be crying, they, who knows? And it's helping open, opening the parents, the guardians' eyes to the issue and how much it is impacting the children. And I think it's, it's a two-way street. Parents can freak out and see that. And I mean, my dad is a civil engineer who works in stormwater. I've been in the environmental world since I was a baby. Mm -hmm. I knew about water pollution probably before I could speak. And that definitely impacted how I view the environment why I do what I do, and vice versa with children, learning about it, taking it to their parents, their grandparents. It's, like you said, almost like a family tree. Mm -hmm. And it can be cyclical, but hopefully, if people take time to address their feelings, learn how to cope, they can move past the cycle of guilt, grief, cynicism into action. It's it's funny because for <clears throat> for myself, one of my if you looked at my identity, like a good thirty percent of it or forty percent of it would just be guilt, like guilt that I flew here from L.A., guilt that I you know uh, used plastic, and um, it, it almost seems as though there are very few human emotions that are two things happening at the same time. The one that comes to mind for me is nostalgia. Nostalgia hurts. Mm -hmm. And there's a longing, but there's also a beauty in mm -hmm. there, right? And you're feeling these two opposite feelings at the exact same time. And it, it, would, um, it would appear as though when it comes to climate, you've got this guilt, but then you've got this, hey, like we've got, like we have to move forward and, and should we splash a little bit of optimism on this guilt and, and present that going forward? Yeah. Is that possible? And, and, and what's the line? Like how, what's the... What's the secret sauce to make it something sustainable? Yeah, it, it's impossible not to have multiple feelings at the same time, yeah. really. And so that's what we talk about in the Climate Change and Happiness podcast. It's, it's not one feeling. So guilt, um, you know, there's a saying in therapy, we hurt where we care. <laughs> so if something's hurting us because we have a value, we care about it, right? So by definition, if, if I'm guilty, there's a value in there. There's a sense of myself. I'm not being my best self, mm -hmm. right? And some of that is structural. Like I, I could figure out, I use... You know, I fly, I fly less than, and I use carbon offsets, and I think about ways to do my, my carbon footprint. So that's one way to do it. So with all therapy, there's either structural changes you make in your life, like you get up 30 minutes earlier every day, and it makes you more productive. That's a structural change. Or there's the mental changes, where I start to think about what are the stories I'm telling myself. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you know, Gotti, you know, uh, if we were working together, um, you know, I, oh, when we're working together, after uh, this, I'm, we're yeah. going to find a couch so, somewhere. <laughs> you know, we talk about your feelings. What are you feeling? Like the, the, the issue with water and Lake Mead and really get into that. And then we'd say, well, what do you want to be? What do you want to be feeling about that? Like what feelings might you want to grow? You know, and it might start with like, you know, feelings you can reach like curiosity or interest or patience. And then it might be inspiration, you know, and then. And then once you have that obligation, then it's like, well, how are you going to find out about it? 
once you learn about Lake Mead and water and meet people that are working on these water issues, which I'm sure there are thousands of them in all different states, and you see the network and you go to the meetings and you talk to the native tribes and everyone, you're gonna feel differently about it and you won't have that, mm -hmm. that, that um, learned helplessness. You know, so it is an educational piece. So that's part of the therapeutic process is, is helping people. You know, we have issues when we have issues. We have the big issues we wanna achieve in the world and we have our own personal stuff, you know, our own personal baggage. And so we're trying to balance those two things. No, we have about zero minutes left here. So just the final question, um, Thomas, when you feel, when you feel that sense of helplessness, what's the first thing that you should do? What do you think, Elena? What happens? What do you do when you feel helpless? I log off of my phone. Okay. <laughs> I log off and take time to go out into nature, whether that's in my backyard or in the mountains, and just unwind and take a second to remind myself why I care, <laughs> why I'm feeling that way. And then once I'm in a better headspace, I go back and take a second look, do some reading, and be like, at the end of the day, I'm like, okay, it wasn't that bad now that I'm calmed down. <laughs> is there anything that when you think, like, why do I care, is there anything that you go back to? I think I always just go back to protecting nature. At the end of the day, that's why I care. It's the nature aspect and the fact that humans are not disconnected from nature, we are a part of nature. And once I kind of, that clicked in my head, I was like, that's why I care and that's why I do what I do. I mean, that's beautiful. <laughs> Uh, I think we have, uh, we have uh, time for a quick question, if we've got one in the audience, yeah. Um, Mike's coming over. I'll just, I'll yeah. <laughs> um, Yaddy, thanks for your work on, um, on the water issue. I, I work on that same area out here and been working on it for a decade, and what amazes me is there are climate deniers and there are climate activists, and there is a huge swath in the middle that doesn't even realize that for example, half their drinking water comes from the Colorado River. Mm -hmm. They live in Phoenix. So there's not denial and there's not activism. They're just living their life. They may even be doom strolling while they idle their car. And I feel like that connection to nature that we're part of it is totally lost. And I'm, I'd love how you think on that because that seems to be one of the greater challenges we face today. It almost seems like th there's a big swath of people that don't have, uh, don't think of their environmental identity in any yeah. sensitive way. Yeah, a quick, a quick answer to that is when I, I help people to think about what nature means a lot of things to a lot of people. But uh, there's a spectrum of nature connection. It, it starts in our home with plants and with art. It, it means nearby nature, like our gardens, our street, it's uh, public spaces, like this, this beautiful place here. And there's also you know, farmland and managed areas, and then there's wilderness. There's a whole spectrum of nature settings and we all have our, our typical style. So one problem is that people think if they're not hiking in the App Appalachians or, or, or something, they're not a nature person. That's not true. We, we are nature. We're all, we cannot live without the nat natural world. So, but it's starting where your, where, where your particular flavor is is, is, a, is, a, is a starter conversation. And so much of that comes from, my, I, I believe the quote is unplugging. <laughs> Unplug. Right? Absolutely. Unplug. I mean, yeah, you can go out with your phone in nature. That's fun, too. But the best thing to do is just to take some time away from your phone and reflect. And again, that can just be on your front porch. It doesn't have to be 10 miles up a mountain. Wonderful. Thank you guys so much for your time. We're going to stick around for a little bit uh, longer on the sides here if, if you guys want to come by and ask some individual questions. Uh, but with that, uh, we thank you so very much for coming. Thank you. Thank you.